An alarm has been set off by a radiation monitor in Los Alamos. Operators are frantically trying to find out how and where the radiation spike has come from. But it's not from what you might think. Rather than something on the site of the world famous nuclear research laboratory getting out, the monitor has been triggered by a truck taking a wrong turn and driving in. Right now, what no one knows is that they have uncovered a radiological incident that will cover two countries and expose over 4,000 people. Unknowingly contaminated material made its way into multiple building sites in both the US and Mexico, showing how close we all are from unknowingly being exposed to radiation. Our story today has a few similar plot points, Cobalt 60 and a scrapyard, but it ramps up the outcome to 11. My name is John, welcome to Plainly Difficult, and today we're looking at the jaw-dropping 1984 Ciudad Juarez radiation incident. Forward. Lost source events aren't unique. Hell, we've even had one this year in 2023 in Australia. They aren't unique, but they are usually discovered quickly in the grand scheme of things. This is because usually people in the vicinity of the source become ill with unexplainable sickness or burns, if they have unknowingly touched it. But what makes the Ciudad Juarez so unique is that it illustrates what can happen when a source makes it into the production of other material. Sure, a similar event happened in Ukraine, where a source was mixed into concrete, but Juarez had far further reaching ramifications. Usually with these sorts of stories, there is some level of criminality, usually the source being stolen. But today our story's criminality starts with a radiation therapy unit being illegally purchased by a private medical company. The machine was a Pika C3000. It was purchased in 1977 by the Central Medicine Private Hospital in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. The machine had been illegally imported into the country without notifying the regulatory authority. It's important that they are informed as they can track where these potentially deadly machines are within the country. But they weren't told. On top of this, the machine with its some 6,000 Cobalt 60 pellets were shipped incorrectly with the source head still mounted. The head's pellets had a total radioactivity of 30 terabecules, aka a ton of bad days. But there is a problem the hospital has with their Pika C3000. No one knows how to use it. Usually when these things are bought the legit way, training for staff is offered. So what do you do with a teletherapy machine you don't know how to use? I know it's a question we've all pondered at least once in our lifetimes. Take it out to dinner? Put it on reception? No, well, sadly, they just put it into storage in an unguarded warehouse. But surprisingly, for one of these stories, it wasn't stolen. Instead, it sat there unused for a number of years, whilst the hospital tried and failed to find anyone who knew how to work it. Time to sell the scrap. After nearly six years in storage, the hospital's maintenance manager instructed hospital employee Vicente Soltello Aladin to sell the machine off for scrap on the 6th of December 1983. I'm guessing Sotelo was unaware of the potentially lethal task he had been given, because otherwise his next few actions would have been insane. Sotelo dismantled the machine, splitting off its valuable metals. In doing so, removing the source head with its thousands of Cobalt 60 pellets. He loaded up his truck and at this point decided to drill into the source cylinder, spilling some of the pellets onto the truck bed. Just so you know, these pellets are around 1mm in diameter and length, so are pretty tiny. Surely there's no way he could have known what they were. Oh, and this little spillage is just the tip of the radioactive iceberg that is this disaster. The truck and its radiotherapy machine cargo make its way to the Yonkey Phoenix scrapyard in Ciudad Juarez. The parts were sold. 
and the scrap merchant wasn't informed of the deadly nature of the material. How could have they been, as the guy selling it clearly didn't either? Usually this is where these stories come to an end, a few people get sick and the source is discovered. But not today. Sotelo, after selling the material to the junkyard, set off to return home. Don't forget, now some of the pellets had fallen out and were still in the truck bed. In a cruel turn of fate, his truck broke down en route home. The now immobile and unknowingly contaminated truck would sit in a side road for 40 days. We'll come back to this a little bit later on in the video. So you know what scrap merchants do, right? Well, they sell scrap for melting into new metal products. And that's exactly what happened to the Cobalt 60 pellets. They became mixed up with the scrap metal and were sold to three foundries. A Seros de Chihuahua foundry where it was pressed into steel for rebar. Falcon Products Company foundry who made table pedestal castings. And a third foundry in Torreon, Mexico that cast valve bodies and electric motor parts using contaminated steel. The rebar and table bases containing the Cobalt 60 by January 1984 had already been shipped throughout Mexico and across the border to the United States. Unknowingly, the contaminated material passed through cities, countryside and towns. But it would be an accidental wrong turn that would cause the discovery of the radioactive material. The discovery. So the intro section of this video I mentioned Los Alamos, but what I didn't mention was just how much of a case of potluck it was. A truck carrying rebar made by Asia was travelling past Los Alamos on the 16th of January 1984. The driver turned his large flatbed truck carrying two bundles of rebar into the entrance of the Mason Physics facility in Los Alamos. The truck driver, realising that this was not where he was meant to be, turned his vehicle around and drove for the exit. This involved driving over a radiation detector underneath a manhole cover. This detected a heightened radiation level, the truck was automatically photographed and was identified as belonging to the Smith Pipe and Steel Company of Albuquerque. For there the shipment was able to be traced back to Mexico at the Aceros de Chihuahua foundry. On January the 17th, the state of New Mexico informed the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, who then informed Mexico's National Commission on Nuclear Safety and Safeguards. It was also discovered that another shipment was at the border in El Paso, Texas, and on the 18th, after investigation, was also found to be contaminated with radiation. This was five truckloads, but hundreds of tons had already reached the US. With a potential international radiation event unfolding, all shipments of steel from Mexico to the USA were ceased. Mexican authorities traced the metal back to the Phoenix Yard and temporarily shut it down for investigation on the 20th of January, and recovered the first Cobalt 60 pellet. Investigation at the junkyard indicated that Cobalt 60 must have been there since at least the 6th of December 1983 since the contaminated bill of landing was dated to the 6th of December. The Mexican authorities ordered Aceros de Chihuahua to suspend the distribution of manufactured rebar until it could be confirmed to be clear of any radioisotopes. Analysis of the contaminated metal showed it was pure cobalt-60. Remember Vicente Soltello Aladdin and his broken down truck? On the 26th of January 1984, Mexican authorities detected an abandoned truck emitting radiation levels of up to a thousand ronkins per hour. Probably not a surprise, it was Sotelo's. Sotelo was tracked down and confirmed ownership, as well as clarifying that he had worked at the Speciality Medical Center, which was then contacted to ask what was the scrap metal they had sold off in December. Well, this was the missing piece. But although the origin was now known, the scale of the recovery and cleanup was only just unfolding. The truck, for one, was parked in the middle of a built up neighbourhood, potentially exposing countless people. This would require the truck to be craned out of the city. Thousands of tons of rebar was contaminated and 33,000 table bases had also been made with radioactive steel. Collaboration between the USA and Mexico allowed an international search to be undertaken. This included 
sharing of sales information of steel products, and the NRC assisting with radiological surveys of Juarez in Mexico. Mexican health officials reported that around 100 persons have received blood tests, of which three or four showed evidence of between 100 and 450 rem whole body doses. For context, a whole body dose of 500 rem at once can be fatal. In both the USA and Mexico, the contaminated metal had to be traced, recovered and disposed of. But even as late as June, material was still missing. Roughly 2,360 tons of unused rebar was recovered. Mexican authorities visited over 17,000 buildings suspected to been have made with contaminated rebar. Scarily, they determined that 814 buildings would need to be demolished and disposed of due to the high levels of radiation. 90% of the rebar shipped to the USA was also recovered. This had come from five states. Aftermath Well, this story is a bit of an odd one. It's not really cut and dry finished, as 100% of the material was never recovered, as no one could have accounted for all of those grains of cobalt-60. As such, the total human cost is impossible to tell. Of the scrapyard workers, neighbours and foundry workers that were tested, some had chromosome damage, and others had abnormal sperm or diminished sperm counts. Countless more must have been exposed from the contaminated metal or that abandoned truck, but it's impossible to know for sure. Vicente Sotelo, the truck owner, was made for scapegoat, with his employer forcing him to sign a confession that he stole the equipment. But this didn't hold up. He wasn't the one who illegally imported the teletherapy machine in the first place after all. But how did he fare with the radiation? After all, he broke open the teletherapy unit. Well, unsurprisingly, he experienced acute radiation syndrome, including burns, vomiting and diarrhea. But amazingly, he survived. No one was known to have died directly from the event, probably due to the exposure being for most over a long period of time. Scarily though, the event, as published by the New York Times in 1984, released radiation a hundred times more intense than a nuclear accident at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. What's even more worrying was that he was only actually discovered because of a chance wrong turn of a delivery truck. Imagine what would have happened if it went undetected. Tens of thousands of people could have been in danger. So ratings time, it's got to be a dumpster fire. But a free on the legacy scale, as of a disaster, has been relatively forgotten, maybe because of no immediate death toll. But regardless, I won't be able to look at rebar the same way again. This is a plain difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plain difficult videos are produced by me, John, in the currently cold but sunny corner of London, UK. I have Patreon members and YouTube members, so thank you for your financial support, as well as the rest of you for tuning in every week. I have Instagram and Twitter, so check them out if you want to see more from me. And if you're enjoying this outro video, then please feel free to go over to my second channel, Made by John, where you can watch and listen to it in full. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching, and Mr. Music, play us out, please. Music